Adi Parva Section 26. Saudi said, and then Indra, the king of gods, having the best of horses for his bearer, thus adored by Kadru, covered the entire firmament with masses of blue clouds. And he commanded the clouds, saying, Pour ye, your vivifying and blessed drops. And those clouds, luminous with lightning, and incessantly roaring against each other in the welkin, poured abundant water. And the sky, in consequence of those wonderful and terribly roaring clouds that were incessantly begetting vast quantities of water, looked as if the end of Yuga had come. And in consequence of the myriads of waves caused in the falling torrents, the deep roar of the clouds, the flashes of lightning, the violence of the wind, and the general agitation, the sky looked as if dancing in madness. The sky became overcast, and the rays of the sun and the moon totally disappeared in consequence of that incessant downpour. And upon Indra's causing that downpour, the Nagas became exceedingly delighted. And the earth was filled with water all around and the cool, clear water reached even the nether regions. And there were countless waves of water all over the earth. And the snakes with their mother reached, in safety, the island called Ramaniyaka. And so ends the 26th section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva Section 27. Saudi said, and then the Nagas drenched by that shower, became exceedingly glad. And borne by that bird of fair feathers, they soon arrived at the island. That island had been fixed by the creator of the universe as the abode of the Makaras. There they saw the terrible Lav Anna Samudra, ocean of salt. On arriving there with Garuda, they saw there a beautiful forest washed by the waters of the sea and resounding with the music of winged choirs. And there were clusters of trees all around laden with various fruits and flowers. And there were also fair mansions all around and many tanks full of lotuses. And it was also adorned with many lakes of pure water. And it was refreshed with pure incense-breathing breezes. And it was adorned with many a tree that grew only on the hills of Malaya, and seemed by their tallness to reach the very heavens. And there were also various other trees whose flowers were scattered all around by the breeze. And that forest was charming and dear to the Gandharvas and always gave them pleasure. And it was full of bees maddened with the honey they sucked. And the sight of all this was exceedingly delightful. And in consequence of many things there, capable of charming everybody, that forest was fair, delightful, and holy. And, echoing with the notes of various birds, it delighted greatly the sons of Kadru. And the snakes, after arriving at that forest, began to enjoy themselves. And they commanded the lord of birds, viz. Garuda, of great energy, saying, Convey us to some other fair island with pure water. Thou ranger of the skies, thou must have seen many fair regions while coursing, through the air. Garuda, altar reflecting for a few moments, asked his mother Vinata, saying, Why, mother, have I to do the bidding of the snakes? Vinata thus questioned by him spake unto that ranger of the skies, her son, invested with every virtue, of great energy, and great strength, as follows. Vinata said, O thou best of birds, I have become, from misfortune, the slave of my co-wife. The snakes, by an act of deception, caused me to lose my bet and have made me so. When his mother had told him the reason, that ranger of the skies, dejected with grief, addressed the snakes, saying, Tell me, ye snakes, by bringing what thing, gaining a knowledge of what thing, or doing what act of prowess, we may be freed from this state of bondage to you. Saudi continued, the snakes, hearing him, said, Bring thou Amrita by force. Then O bird, shall you be freed from bondage. And so ends the 27th section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva section 28. Saudi said, Garuda, thus addressed by the snakes, then said unto his mother, I shall go to bring Amrita, I desire to eat something in the way. Direct me to it. Vinata replied, in a remote region in the midst of the ocean, the Nishadas have their fair home. Having eaten the thousands of Nishadas that live there, bring thou Amrita. But let not thy heart be ever set on taking the life of a Brahmana. Of all creatures a Brahmana must not be slain. He is, indeed, like fire. A Brahmana, when angry, becomes like fire or the sun, like poison or an edged weapon. A Brahmana, it has been said, is the master of all creatures. For these and other reasons, a Brahmana is the adored of the virtuous. O child, he is never to be slain by thee even in anger. Hostility with Brahmanas, therefore, would not be proper under any circumstances. O sinless one, 
neither Agni nor Surya truly can consume so much as does a Brahmana of rigid vows, when angry. By these various indications must thou know a good Brahmana. Indeed, a Brahmana is the firstborn of all creatures, the foremost of the four orders, the father and the master of all. Garuda then asked, O mother, of what form is a Brahmana, of what behavior, and of what prowess? Doth he shine like fire, or is he of tranquil mien? And, O mother, it behoveth thee to tell my inquiring self, those auspicious signs by which I may recognize a Brahmana. Vinata replied, saying, O child, him shouldst thou know as the best amongst Brahmanas who having entered thy throat would torture thee as a fish hook or burn thee as blazing charcoal. A Brahmana must never be slain by thee even in anger. And Vinata out of affection for her son, again told him these words, him shouldst thou know as a good Brahmana who would not be digested in thy stomach. Although she knew the incomparable strength of her son, yet she blessed him heartily, for, deceived by the snakes, she was very much afflicted by woe. And she said, Let Marut, the god of the winds, protect thy wings, and Surya and Soma thy vertebral regions. Let Agni protect thy head, and the Vasus thy whole body. I also, O child, engaged in beneficial ceremonies, shall sit here for your welfare. Go then, O child, in safety to accomplish thy purpose. Saudi continued, then Garuda, having heard the words of his mother, stretched his wings and ascended the skies. And endued with great strength, he soon fell upon the Nishadas, hungry and like another Yama. And bent upon slaying the Nishadas, he raised a great quantity of dust that overspread the firmament, and sucking up water from amid the ocean, shook the trees growing on the adjacent mountains. And then that lord of birds obstructed the principal thoroughfares of the town of the Nishadas by his mouth, increasing its orifice at will. And the Nishadas began to fly in great haste in the direction of the open mouth of the great serpent eater. And as birds in great affliction ascend by thousand into the skies when the trees in a forest are shaken by the winds, so those Nishadas blinded by the dust raised by the storm entered the wide extending cleft of Garuda's mouth open to receive them. And then the hungry lord of all rangers of the skies, that oppressor of enemies, endued with great strength, and moving with greatest celerity to achieve his end, closed his mouth, killing innumerable nishadas following the occupation of fishermen. So ends the 28th section in the Astika Parva of Adi Parva. Adi Parva section 29. Sauti continued, a certain Brahmana with his wife had entered the throat of that ranger of the skies. The former began to bum the bird's throat like a piece of flaming charcoal. Him Garuda addressed, saying, O best of Brahmanas, come out soon from my mouth which I open for thee. A Brahmana must never be slain by me, although he may be always engaged in sinful practices. Unto Gamda who had thus addressed him that Brahmana said, Oh! Let this woman of the Nishada caste, who is my wife, also come out with me. And Gamda said, Taking the woman also of the Nishada caste with thee, come out soon. Save thyself without delay since thou hast not yet been digested by the heat of my stomach. Saudi continued, and then that Brahmana, accompanied by his wife of the Nishada caste, came out, and praising Gamda wended whatever way he liked. And when that Brahmana had come out with his wife, that lord of birds, fleet as the mind, stretching his wings ascended the skies. He then saw his father, and, hailed by him, Gamda, of incomparable prowess made proper answers. And the great Rishi, Kasyapa, then asked him, O child, is it well with thee? Dost thou get sufficient food every day? Is there food in plenty for thee in the world of men? Gamda replied, My mother is ever well. And so is my brother, and so am I but, Father, I do not always obtain plenty of food, for which my peace is incomplete. I am sent by the snakes to fetch the excellent Amrita. Indeed, I shall fetch it today for emancipating my mother from her bondage. My mother command me, saying, Eat thou the Nishadas. I have eaten them by thousands, but my hunger is not appeased. Therefore, O worshipful one, point out to me some other food, by eating which, O master, I may be strong enough to bring away Amrita by force. Thou shouldst indicate some food wherewith I may appease my hunger and thirst. Kasyapa replied, This lake thou seest is sacred. It hath been heard, of even in the heavens. There is an elephant, with face downwards, who continually draggeth a tortoise, his elder brother. I shall speak to you in detail of their hostility in former life. Just listen as I tell you why they are here. There was of old a great rishi of the name of Vibhavazu. 
he was exceedingly wrathful. He had a younger brother of the name of Supritika. The latter was averse to keeping his wealth jointly with his brothers. And Supritika would always speak of partition. After some time his brother Vibhavazu told Supritika, It is from great foolishness that persons blinded by love of wealth always desire to make a partition of their patrimony. After effecting a partition they fight with each other, deluded by wealth. Then again, enemies in the guise of friends cause estrangements between ignorant and selfish men alter they become separated in wealth, and pointing out faults confirm their quarrels, so that the latter soon fall one by one. Absolute ruin very soon overtakes the separated. For these reasons the wise never speak approvingly of partition amongst brothers who, when divided, do not regard the most authoritative sastras and live always in fear of each other. But as thou, Supratika, without regarding my advice impelled by desire of separation, always wishest to make an arrangement about your property, thou shall become an elephant. Supratika, thus cursed, then spake unto Vibhavazu. Thou also shall become a tortoise moving in the midst of the waters. And thus on account of wealth those two fools, Supradika and Vibhavazu, from each other's curse, have become an elephant and a tortoise respectively. Owing to their wrath, they have both become inferior animals. And they are engaged in hostilities with each other, proud of their excessive strength and the weight of their bodies. And in this lake those two beings of huge bodies are engaged in acts according to their former hostility. Look here, one amongst them, the handsome elephant of huge body, is even now approaching. Hearing his roar, the tortoise also of huge body, living within the waters, cometh out, agitating the lake violently. And seeing him the elephant, curling his trunk, resheth into the water. And endued with great energy, with motion of his tusks and fore part of his trunk and tail and feet, he agitates the water of the lake abounding with fishes. And the tortoise also of great strength, with upraised head, cometh forward for an encounter. And the elephant is six yojanas in height and twice that measure in circumference. And the height of the tortoise also is three yojanas in his circumference ten. Eat thou up both of them that are madly engaged in the encounter and bent upon slaying each other, and then accomplish the task that thou desirest. Eating that fierce elephant which looketh like a huge mountain and resembleth a mass of dark clouds, bring thou Amrita. Saudi continued, having said so unto Garuda, he, Kasyapa, blessed him, saying, Blessed be thou when thou art in combat with the gods. Let water pitchers filled to the brim, brahmanas, kind, and other auspicious objects, bless thee, thou oviparous one. And, O thou of great strength, when thou art engaged with the gods in combat, let the ricks, the yajas, the samas, the sacred sacrificial butter, all the mysteries, Upanishads, constitute thy strength. Garuda, thus addressed by his father, wended to the side of that lake. He saw that expanse of clear water with birds of various kinds all around. And remembering the words of his father, that ranger of the skies possessed of great swiftness of motion, seized the elephant and the tortoise, one in each claw. And that bird then soared high into the air. And he came upon a sacred place called Alamva and saw many divine trees. And struck by the wind raised by his wings, those trees began to shake with fear. And those divine trees having golden boughs feared that they would break. And the ranger of the skies seeing that those trees capable of granting every wish were quaking with fear, went to other trees of incomparable appearance. And those gigantic trees were adorned with fruits of gold and silver and branches of precious gems. And they were washed with the water of the sea. And there was a large banyan among them, which had grown into gigantic proportions, that spoke unto that lord of bird coursing towards it with the fleetness of the mind. Sit thou on this large branch of mine extending a hundred yojanas and eat the elephant and the tortoise. When that best of birds, of great swiftness and a body resembling a mountain, quickly alighted upon a bough of that banyan tree, the resort of thousands of winged creatures that bough also full of leaves shook and broke down. So ends the twenty-ninth section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva Section 30. Saudi said, at the very touch by Garuda of great might with his feet, the branch of the tree broke as it was caught by Garuda. Casting his eyes around in wonder he saw Valakilya Rishis hanging therefrom with heads downwards and engaged in ascetic penances. Reflecting that if that bough fell down, the Rishis would be slain, the mighty one held the elephant and the tortoise still more firmly with his claws. And from fear of slaying the Rishis and desire of saving them, 
held that bow in his beaks, and rose on his wings. The great rishis were struck with wonder at the sight of that act of his which was beyond even the power of the gods, and gave that mighty bird a name. And they said, As this ranger of the skies rises on its wings bearing a heavy burden, let this foremost of birds having snakes for his food be called Garuda, bearer of heavy weight. And shaking the mountains by his wings, Garuda leisurely coursed through the skies. And as he soared with the elephant and the tortoise, in his claws, he beheld various regions underneath. Desiring as he did to save the Valachilius, he saw not a spot whereon to sit. At last he went to that foremost of mountains called Gandamadana. There he saw his father Kasyapa engaged in ascetic devotions. Kasyapa also saw his son, that ranger of the skies, of divine form, possessed of great splendor, and energy and strength, and endued with the speed of the wind or the mind, huge as a mountain peak, a ready smiter like the curse of a Brahmana, inconceivable, indescribable, frightful to awe creatures, possessed of great prowess, terrible, of the splendor of Agni himself, and incapable of being overcome by the deities, Danavas, and invincible Rikshasas, capable of splitting mountain summits and sucking the ocean itself and destroying the three worlds, fierce, and looking like Yama himself. The illustrious Kasyapa, seeing him approach and knowing also his motive, spoke unto him these words. Kasyapa said, O child, do not commit a rash act, for then thou wouldst have to suffer pain. The Valachilius, supporting themselves by drinking the rays of the sun, might, if angry, blast thee. Saudi continued. Kasyapa then propitiated, for the sake of his son, the Valachilius of exceeding good fortune and whose sins had been destroyed by ascetic penances. And Kasyapa said, Ye whose wealth is asceticism, the essay of Garuda is for the good of all creatures. The task is great that he is striving to accomplish. It behoveth you to accord him your permission. Saudi continued, Those ascetics thus addressed by the illustrious Kasyapa, abandoned that bow and went to the sacred mountain of Hamavat for purposes of ascetic penances. After those rishis had gone away, the son of Vinata, with voice obstructed by the bow in his beaks, asked his father Kasyapa saying, O illustrious one, where shall I throw this arm of the tree? O illustrious one, indicate to me some region without human beings. Then Kasyapa spoke of a mountain without human beings with caves and dales always covered with snow and incapable of approach by ordinary creatures even in thought. And the great bird bearing that branch, that elephant, and that tortoise, proceeded with great speed towards that mountain. The great arm of the tree with which that bird of huge body flew away could not be girt round with a cord made of a hundred cow hides. Garuda, the lord of birds, then flew away for hundreds of thousands of yojanas within, the shortest time. And going according to the directions of his father to that mountain almost in a moment, that ranger of the skies let fall the gigantic bough. And it fell with a great noise. And that prince of mountains shook, struck with the storm raised by Garuda's wings. And the trees thereon dropped showers of flowers. And the peaks decked with gems and gold adorning that great mountain itself, were loosened and tell down on all sides. And the falling bough struck down numerous trees which, with golden flowers amid dark foliage, shone there like clouds charged with lightning. And those trees, bright as gold, falling down upon the ground and, dyed with mountain metals, shone as if they were bathed in the rays of the sun. Then that best of birds, Garuda, perching on the summit of that mountain, ate both the elephant and the tortoise, rose on his wings with great speed from the top of the mountain. And various omens began to appear among the gods foreboding fear. Indra's favorite thunderbolt blazed up in a fright. Meteors with flames and smoke, loosened from the welkin, shot down during the day. And the weapons of the Vasus, the Rudras, the Adityas, the Sabyas, the Murats, and other gods, began to spend their force against one another. Such a thing had never happened even during the war between the gods and the Asuras. And the winds blew accompanied with thunder, and meteors fell by thousands. And the sky, though cloudless, roared tremendously. And even he who was the god of gods shed showers of blood. And the flowery garlands on the necks of the gods faded and their prowess suffered diminution. And terrible masses of clouds dropped thick showers of blood. And the dust raised by the winds darkened the splendor of the very coronets of the gods. And he of a thousand sacrifices, Indra, with the other gods, perplexed with fear at the sight of those dark forebodings spoke unto Vrihaspati thus, Why, O worshipful one, have these natural disturbances suddenly arisen? No foe do I behold who would oppress us in war. Vrihaspati answered, O chief of the gods, 
O thou of a thousand sacrifices, it is from thy fault and carelessness, and owing also to the ascetic penance of the high-souled great Rishis, the Valakilias, that the son of Kasyapa and Vinata, a ranger of the skies endued with great strength and possessing the capacity of assuming at will any form, is approaching to take away the Soma. And that bird, foremost among all endued with great strength, is able to rob you of the Soma. Everything is possible with him, the unachievable he can achieve. Saudi continued, Indra, having heard these words, then spoke unto those that guarded the Amrita, saying, A bird endued with great strength and energy has set his heart on taking away the Amrita. I warn you beforehand so that he may not succeed in taking it away by force. Vrihaspati has told me that his strength is immeasurable. And the gods hearing of it were amazed and took precautions. And they stood surrounding the Amrita and Indra also of great prowess, the wielder of the thunder, stood with them. And the gods wore curious breastplates of gold, of great value, and set with gems, and bright leathern armor of great toughness. And the mighty deities wielded various sharp-edged weapons of terrible shapes, countless in number, emitting, even all of them, sparks of fire with smoke. And they were also armed with many a discus and iron mace furnished with spikes, and trident, battle-axe, and various kinds of sharp-pointed missiles and polished swords and maces of terrible form, all befitting their respective bodies. And decked with celestial ornaments and resplendent with those bright arms, the gods waited there, their fears allayed. And the gods, of incomparable strength, energy, and splendor, resolved to protect the Amrita. Capable of splitting the towns of the Asuras, all displayed themselves in forms resplendent as the fire. And in consequence of the gods standing there, that, would be, battle field, owing to hundreds of thousands of maces furnished with iron spikes, shone like another firmament illumined by the rays of the sun. So ends the thirtieth section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva Section 31. Sonika said, O son of Suda, what was Indra's fault? What is act of carelessness? How was Garuda bomb in consequence of the ascetic penances of the Valakilius? Why also Kasyapa, a Brahmin, had the king of birds for a son? Why, too, was he invincible of all creatures and unslayable of all? Why also was that ranger of the skies capable of going into every place at will and of mustering at will any measure of energy? If these are described in the Purana, I should like to hear them. Saudi said, what thou askest me is, indeed, the subject of the Purana. O twice-born one, listen as I briefly recite it all. Once upon a time, when the Lord of creation, Kasyapa, was engaged in a sacrifice from desire of offspring, the Rishis, the gods, and the Ganda Rvas, all gave him help. And Indra was appointed by Kasyapa to bring the sacrificial fuel, and with him those ascetics the Valakilius, and all the other deities. And the Lord Indra, taking up according to his own strength, a weight that was mountain-like, brought it without any fatigue. And he saw on the way some rishis, of bodies of the measure of the thumb, altogether carrying one single stalk of a palasa, butia frondosa, leaf. And those rishis were, from want of food, very lean and almost merged in their own bodies. And they were so weak that they were much afflicted when sunk in the water that collected in an indentation on the road produced by the hoof of a cow. And Purandara, proud of his strength, beheld them with surprise, and laughing at them in derision soon left them behind insulting them, besides, by passing over their heads. And those rishis being thus insulted were filled with rage and sorrow. And they made preparations for a great sacrifice at which Indra was terrified. Here, O Sonika, of the wish for accomplishment of which those vow observing wise, and excellent ascetics poured clarified butter of the sacrificial fire with loudly uttered mantras, there shall be another Indra of all gods, capable of going everywhere at will, and of mustering at will any measure of energy, and striking tear into the, present, king of the gods. By the fruit of our ascetic penance, let one arise, fleet as the mind, and fierce withal. And the lord of the celestials of a hundred sacrifices, having come to know of this, became very much alarmed and sought the protection of the vow observing Kasyapa. And the Prajapati Kasyapa, hearing everything from Indra, went to the Valakilius and asked them if their sacrifice had been successful. And those truth-speaking rishis replied to him, saying, Let it be as thou sayest. And the Prajapati Kasyapa pacifying them, spake unto them as follows, By the word of Brahman, this one, Indra, hath been made the lord of the three worlds. Ye ascetics, ye also are striving to create another Indra. 
Ye excellent ones, it behoveth you not to falsify the word of Brahman. Let not also this purpose, for, accomplishing, which ye are striving, be rendered futile. Let there spring an Indra, Lord, of winged creatures, endued with excessive strength. Be gracious unto Indra who is a suppliant before you. And the Valakilius, thus addressed by Kasyapa, after offering reverence to that first of the Munis, viz. the Prajapati Kasyapa, spake unto him. The Valakilius said, O Prajapati, this sacrifice of us all is for an Indra. Indeed this hath also been meant for a son being born unto thee. Let this task be now left to thee. And in this matter do whatsoever thou seest to be good and proper. Saudi continued. Meanwhile, moved by the desire of offspring, the good daughter of Daksha, the vow observing, amiable, and fortunate Vinata, her ascetic penances over, having purified herself with a bath in that season when connubial companionship might prove fruitful, approached her lord. And Kasyapa spake unto her, respected one, the sacrifice commenced by me hath borne fruit. What hath been desired by thee shall come to pass. Two heroic sons, shall be born unto thee, who shall be the lords of the three worlds. By the penances of the Valakilius and by virtue of the desire with which I commenced my sacrifice, those sons shall be of exceedingly good fortune and worshipped in the three worlds. And the illustrious Kasyapa spake unto her again, Bear thou these auspicious seeds with great care. These two will be the lords of all winged creatures. These heroic rangers of the skies will be respected in all the worlds, and capable of assuming any form at will. And the Prajapati, gratified with all that took place, then addressed Indra of a hundred sacrifices, saying, Thou shalt have two brothers of great energy and prowess, who shall be to thee even as the helpmates. From them no injury shall result unto thee. Let thy sorrow cease, thou shalt continue as the lord of all. Let not, however, the utterers of the name of Brahma be ever again slighted by thee. Nor let the very wrathful ones, whose words are even the thunderbolt, be ever again insulted by thee. Indra, thus addressed, went to heaven, his fears dispelled. And Vinata also, her purpose fulfilled, was exceedingly glad. And she gave birth to two sons, Aruna and Garuda. And Aruna, of undeveloped body, became the forerunner of the sun. And Garuda was vested with the lordship over the birds. O thou of Brigu's race, hearken now to the mighty achievement of Garuda. So ends the 31st section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva section 32. Saudi said, O foremost of Brahmanas, the gods having prepared for battle in that way, Garuda, the king of birds, soon came upon those wise ones. And the gods beholding him of excessive strength began to quake with fear, and strike one another with all their weapons. And amongst those that guarded the Soma was Brahmana, the celestial architect, of measureless might, effulgent as the electric fire and of great energy. And after a terrific encounter lasting only a moment, managed by the lord of birds with his talons, beak, and wings, he lay as dead on the fields. And the ranger of the skies making the worlds dark with the dust raised by the hurricane of his wings, overwhelmed the celestials with it. And the latter, overwhelmed with that dust, swooned away. And the immortals who guarded the Amrita, blinded by that dust, could no longer see Garuda. Even thus did Garuda agitate the region of the heavens. And even thus he mangled the gods with the wounds inflicted by his wings and beak. Then the god of a thousand eyes commanded Vayu, the god of wind, saying, Dispel thou this shower of dust soon. O Maruta, this is indeed, thy task. Then the mighty Vayu soon drove away that dust. And when the darkness had disappeared, the celestials attacked Garuda. And as he of great might was attacked by the gods, he began to roar aloud, like the great cloud that appeareth in the sky at the end of the Yuga, frightening every creature. And that king of birds, of great energy, that slayer of hostile heroes, then rose on his wings. All the wise ones, the celestials, with Indra amongst them armed with double-edged broad swords, iron maces furnished with sharp spikes, pointed lances, maces, bright arrows, and many a discus of the form of the sun, saw him overhead. And the king of birds, attacked them on all sides with showers of various weapons and fought exceedingly hard without wavering for a moment. And the son of Vinata, of great prowess blazing in the sky, attacked the gods on all sides with his wings and breast. And blood began to flow copiously from the bodies of the gods mangled by the talons and the beak of Garuda. Overcome by the lord of birds, the Satyas with the Gandharvas fled eastwards, 
the Vasus with the Rudras towards the south, the Adikyas towards the west, and the twin Aswins towards the north. Gifted with great energy, they retreated fighting, looking back every moment on their enemy. And Garuda had encounters with the Yakshas, Aswakranda of great courage, Renuka, the bold Kraithanaka, Tapana, Aluka, Swasanaka, Namisha, Praruja, and Palina. And the son of Vinata mangled them with his wings, talons, and beak, like Shiva himself, that chastiser of enemies, and the holder of Panaka in rage at the end of the Yuga. And those Yakshas of great might and courage, mangled all over by that ranger of the skies, looked like masses of black clouds dropping thick showers of blood. And Garuda, depriving them of life, and then went to where the Amrita was. And he saw that it was surrounded on all sides by fire. And the terrible flames of that fire covered the entire sky. And moved by violent winds, they seemed bent on burning the sun himself. The illustrious Garuda then assumed ninety times ninety mouths and quickly drinking the waters of many rivers with those mouths and returning with great speed. That chastiser of enemies, having wings for his vehicle extinguished that fire with that water. And extinguishing that fire, he assumed a very small form, desirous of entering into the place where the Soma was. So ends the 32nd section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva section 33. Santi said, and that bird, assuming a golden body bright as the rays of the sun, entered with great force, the region where the Soma was, like a torrent entering the ocean. And he saw, placed near the Soma, a wheel of steel keen-edged, and sharp as the razor, revolving incessantly. And that fierce instrument, of the splendor of the blazing sun and of terrible form, had been devised by the gods for cutting in pieces all robbers of the Soma. Garuda, seeing a passage through it, stopped there for a moment. Diminishing his body, in an instant he passed through the spokes of that wheel. Within the line of the wheel, he beheld, stationed there for guarding the Soma two great snakes of the effulgence of blazing fire, with tongues bright as the lightning flash, of great energy, with mouth emitting fire, with blazing eyes, containing poison, very terrible, always in anger, and of great activity. Their eyes were ceaselessly inflamed with rage and were also winkless. He who may be seen by even one of the two would instantly be reduced to ashes. The bird of fair feathers suddenly covered their eyes with dust. And unseen by them he attacked them from all sides. And the son of Vinata, that ranger of the skies, attacking their bodies, mangled them into pieces. He then approached the Soma without loss of time. Then the mighty son of Vinata, taking up the Amrita from the place where it was kept, rose on his wings with great speed, breaking into pieces the machine that had surrounded it. And the bird soon came out, taking the Amrita but without drinking it himself. And he then wended on his way without the least fatigue, darkening the splendor of the sun. And the son of Vinata then met Vishnu on his way along the sky. And Narayana was gratified at that act of self-denial on the part of Garuda. And that deity, knowing no deterioration, said unto the ranger of the skies, Oh, I am inclined to grant thee a boon. The ranger of the skies thereupon said, I shall stay above thee. And he again spake unto Narayana these words, I shall be immortal and free from disease without, drinking, Amrita. Vishnu said unto the son of Vinata, Be it so. Garuda, receiving those two boons, told Vishnu, I also shall grant thee a boon. Therefore, let the possessor of the six attributes ask of me. Vishnu then asked the mighty Garuda to become his carrier. And he made the bird sit on the flagstaff of his car, saying, Even thus thou shalt stay above me. And the ranger of the skies, of great speed, saying unto Narayana, Be it so, swiftly wended on his way, mocking the wind with his fleetness. And while that foremost of all rangers of the skies, that first of winged creatures, Garuda, was coursing through the air after resting the Amrita, Indra hurled at him his thunderbolt. Then Garuda, the lord of birds, struck with thunderbolt, spake laughingly unto Indra engaged in the encounter, in sweet words, saying, I shall respect the Rishi, Dadichi, of whose bone the Vajra hath been made. I shall also respect the Vajra, and thee also of a thousand sacrifices. I cast this feather of mine whose end thou shalt not attain. Struck with thy thunder I have not felt the slightest pain. And having said this, the king of birds cast a feather of his. And all creatures became exceedingly glad, beholding that excellent feather of Garuda so cast off. And seeing that the feather was very beautiful, they said, 
let this bird be called Saparna, having fair feathers. And Purandara of a thousand eyes, witnessing this wonderful incident, thought that bird to be some great being and addressed him thus. And Indra said, O best of birds, I desire to know the limit of thy great strength. I also desire eternal friendship with thee. So ends the 33rd section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva section 34. Saudi continued. Garuda then said, O Purandara, let there be friendship between thee and me as thou desirest. My strength, know thou, is hard to bear. O thou of a thousand sacrifices, the good never approve of speaking highly of their own strength, nor do they speak of their own merits. But being made a friend, and asked by thee, O friend, I will answer thee, although self-praise without reason is ever improper. I can bear, on a single feather of mine, O Sakra, this earth, with her mountains and forests and with the waters of the ocean, and with thee also stationed thereon. Know thou, my strength is such that I can bear without fatigue even all the worlds put together, with their mobile and immobile objects. Saudi continued, O Sonika, after Garuda of great courage had thus spoken, Indra the chief of the gods, the wearer of the, celestial, crown, ever bent upon the good of the worlds, replied, saying, It is as thou sayest. Everything is possible in thee. Accept now my sincere and hearty friendship. And if thou hast no concern with the Soma, return it to me. Those to whom thou wouldst give it would always oppose us. Garuda answered, There is a certain reason for which the Soma is being carried by me. I shall not give the Soma to anyone for drink. But, O thou of a thousand eyes, after I have placed it down, thou, O Lord of the heavens, canst then, taking it up, instantly bring it away. Indra then said, O oviparous one, I am highly gratified with these words now spoken by thee. O best of all rangers of the skies, accept from me any boon that thou desirest. Saudi continued, Then Garuda, recollecting the sons of Kadru and remembering also the bondage of his mother caused by an act of deception owing to the well-known reason, viz. the curse of Aruna, said, Although I have power over all creatures, yet I shall do your bidding. Let, O Sakra, the mighty snakes become my food. The slayer of the Danavas having said unto him, Be it so, then went to Hari, the god of gods, of great soul, and the lord of yogans. And the latter sanctioned everything that had been said by Garuda. And the illustrious lord of heaven again said unto Garuda, I shall bring away the Soma when thou plackest it down. And having said so, he bade farewell to Garuda. And the bird of fair feathers then went to the presence of his mother with great speed. And Garuda in joy then spake unto all the snakes, here have I brought the Amrita. Let me place it on some kusa grass. O ye snakes, sitting here, drink of it after ye have performed your ablutions and religious rites. As said by you, let my mother become, from this day, free, for I have accomplished your bidding. The snakes having said unto Garuda, be it so, then went to perform their ablutions. Meanwhile, Sakra taking up the Amrita, wended back to heaven. The snakes after performing their ablutions, their daily devotions, and other sacred rites, returned in joy, desirous of drinking the Amrita. They saw that the bed of Kusa grass whereon the Amrita had been placed was empty, the Amrita itself having been taken away by a counter not act of deception. And they began to lick with their tongues the Kusa grass, as the Amrita had been placed thereon. And the tongues of the snakes by that act became divided in twain. And the Kusa grass, too, from the contact with Amrita, became sacred thenceforth. Thus did the illustrious Garuda bring Amrita, from the heavens, for the snakes, and thus were the tongues of snakes divided by what Garuda did. Then the bird of fair feathers, very much delighted, enjoyed himself in those woods accompanied by his mother. Of grand achievements, and deeply reverenced by all rangers of the skies, he gratified his mother by devouring the snakes. That man who would listen to this story, or read it out to an assembly of good brahmanas, must surely go to heaven, acquiring great merit from the recitation of, the feats of, Garuda. And so ends the 34th section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva section 35. Sonika said, O son of Suda, thou hast told us the reason why the snakes were cursed by their mother and why Vinata also was cursed by her son. Thou hast also told us about the bestowal of boons, by their husband, on Kadru and Vinata. Thou hast likewise told us the names of Vinata's sons. 
but thou hast not yet recited to us the names of the snakes. We are anxious to hear the names of the principal ones. Saudi said, O thou whose wealth is asceticism, from fear of being lengthy, I shall not mention the names of all the snakes. But I will recite the names of the chief ones. Listen to me. Sesha was born first, and then Vasuki. Then were Baum, Aravada, Takshaka, Karkotaka, Donajaya, Kalakeya, the serpent Mani, Purana, Pinyarika, and Elipatra, Vimana, Nila, Anila, Kalmasha, Savala, Ariyaka, Ugra, Kalasapotaka, Suramuka, Dadimuka, Vimalapindaka, Apta, Karotaka, Samka, Valisika, Nisthanaka, Himaguha, Nahusha, Pingala, Vayakarna, Hastipada, Mudgarapandaka, Kamvala Aswatara, Kalayaka, Vrita, Samvartaka, Padma, Mahapama, Sankamuka, Kushmandaka, Shamaka, Pindaraka, Karavira, Pushpadanstraka, Vilwaka, Vilwapandara, Mushikada, Sankasiras, Pumabhadra, Haradraka, Aparahita, Jodika, Srivaha, Karavya, Dhritarashtra, Sankapinda, Virajas, Suvahu, Salapinda, Prabhakara, Hastipinda, Pitharaka, Sumiksha, Kaunapashana, Kuthara, Kunjara, Kumuda, Kumadaksha, Titri, Halika, Kardama, Vahumulaka, Karkara, Akarkara, Kundodara, and Mahodara. Thus, O best of regenerate ones, have I said the names of the principal serpents. From fear of being tedious I do not give names of the rest. O thou whose wealth is asceticism, the sons of these snakes, with their grandsons, are innumerable. Reflecting upon this, I shall not name them to thee. O best ascetics, in this world the number of snakes baffles calculation, there being many thousands and millions of them. So ends the 35th section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva Section 36. Sonika said, O child, thou hast named many of the serpents gifted with great energy and incapable of being easily overcome. What did they do after hearing of that curse? Saudi said, the illustrious Sesha amongst them, of great renown, leaving his mother practiced hard penances, living upon air and rigidly observing his vows. He practiced these ascetic devotions, repairing to Gandamadana, Vajri, Gokarna, the woods of Pushkara, and the foot of Hamavat. And he passed his days in those sacred regions, some of which were sacred for their water and others for their soil in the rigid observance of his vows, with singleness of aim, and his passions under complete control. And the grandsire of all, Brahma, saw that ascetic with knotted hair, clad in rags, and his flesh, skin, and sinews dried up owing to the hard penances he was practicing. And the grandsire addressing him, that penance practicing one of great fortitude, said, What is that thorn doest, O Sesha? Let the welfare of the creatures of the worlds also engage thy thoughts. O sinless one, thou art afflicting all creatures by thy hard penances. O Sesha, tell me the desire implanted in thy breast. And Sesha replied, My uterine brothers are all of wicked hearts. I do not desire to live amongst them. Let this be sanctioned by thee. Like enemies they are always jealous of one another. I am, therefore, engaged in ascetic devotions. I will not see them even. They never show any kindness for Vinata and her son. Indeed, Vinata's son capable of ranging through the skies, is another brother of ours. They always envy him. And he, too, is much stronger owing to the bestowal of that boon by our father, the high-souled Kasyapa. For these, I engaged in ascetic penances, and I will cast off this body of mine, so that I may avoid companionship with them, even in another state of life. Unto Sesha who had said so, the grandsire said, O Sesha, I know the behavior of all thy brothers and their great danger owing to their offense against their mother. But O snake, a remedy, for this, hath been provided by me even beforehand. It behoveth thee not to grieve for thy brothers. O Sesha, ask of me the boon thou desirest. I have been highly gratified with thee and I will grant thee today a boon. O best of snakes, it is fortunate that thy heart hath been set on virtue. Let thy heart be more and more firmly set on virtue. Then Sesha replied, O divine grandsire, this is the boon desired by me. Viz. May my heart always delight in virtue and in blessed ascetic penances, O Lord of all. Brahman said, O Sesha, 
I am exceedingly gratified with this thy self-denial and love of peace. But, at my command, let this act be done by thee for the good of my creatures. Bear thou, O Sesha, properly and well this earth so unsteady with her mountains and forests, her seas and towns and retreats, so that she may be steady. Sesha said, O divine Lord of all creatures, O bestower of boons, O Lord of the earth, Lord of every created thing, Lord of the universe, I will, even as thou sayest hold the earth steady. Therefore, O Lord of all creatures, place her on my head. Brahman said, O best of snakes, go underneath the earth. She will herself give thee a crevice to pass through. And, O Sesha, by holding the earth, thou shalt certainly do what is prized by me very greatly. Saudi continued, Then the elder brother of the king of the snakes, entering a hole, passed to the other side of the earth, and holding her, supported with his head that goddess with her belt of seas passing all round. Brahman said, O Sesha, O best of snakes, thou art the god Dharma, because alone, with thy huge body, thou supportest the earth with everything on her, even as I myself, or Valavit, Indra, can. Saudi continued, the snake, Sesha, the lord Ananta, of great prowess, lives underneath the earth, alone supporting the world at the command of Brahman. And the illustrious grandsire, the best of the immortals, then gave unto Ananta the bird of fair feathers, viz. the son of Vinata, for Ananta's help. So ends the 36th section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva section 37. Saudi said, that best of snakes, viz. Vasuki, hearing the curse of his mother, reflected how to render it abortive. He held a consultation with all his brothers, Aravada and others, intent upon doing what they deemed best for themselves. And Vasuki said, O ye sinless ones, the object of this curse is known to you. It behoveth us to strive to neutralize it. Remedies certainly exist for all curses, but no remedy can avail those cursed by their mother. Hearing that this curse hath been uttered in the presence of the immutable, the infinite, and the true one, my heart trembleth. Surely, our annihilation hath come. Otherwise why should not the immutable Lord prevent our mother while uttering the curse? Therefore, let us consult today how we may secure the safety of the snakes. Let us not waste time. All of you are wise and discerning. We will consult together and find out the means of deliverance as, did, the gods of yore to regain lost Agni who had concealed himself within a cave, so that Janamejaya's sacrifice for the destruction of the snakes may not take place, and so that we may not meet with destruction. Saudi continued, thus addressed all the offspring of Kadru assembled together, and, wise in councils, submitted their opinions to one another. One party of the serpent said, we should assume the guise of superior Brahmanas, and beseech Janamejaya, saying, This, intended, sacrifice of yours ought not to take place. Other snakes thinking themselves wise, said, We should all become his favorite counselors. He will then certainly ask for our advice in all projects. And we will then give him such advice that the sacrifice may be obstructed. The king, the foremost of wise men, thinking us of sterling worth will certainly ask us about his sacrifice. We will say, it must not be. And pointing to many serious evils in this and the next worlds, we will take care that the sacrifice may not take place. Or, let one of the snakes, approaching, bite the person who, intending the monarch's good, and well acquainted with the rites of the snake sacrifice, may be appointed as the sacrificial priest, so that he will die. The sacrificial priest dying, the sacrifice will not be completed. We will also bite all those who, acquainted with the rites of the snake sacrifice, may be appointed Ritwiks of the sacrifice, and by that means attain our object. Other snakes, more virtuous and kind, said, Oh, this counsel of yours is evil. It is not meet to kill Brahmanas. In danger, that remedy is proper, which is blessed on the practices of the righteous. Unrighteousness finally destroyeth the world. Other serpents said, We will extinguish the blazing sacrificial fire by ourselves becoming clouds luminous with lightning and pouring down showers. Other snakes, the best of their kind, proposed, going, by night, let us steal away the vessel of soma juice. That will disturb the right. Or, at that sacrifice, let the snakes, by hundreds and thousands, bite the people, and spread terror around. Or, let the serpents defile the pure food with their food defiling urine and dung. Other said, let us become the king's ritwiks, and obstruct his sacrifice by saying at the outset, give us the sacrificial fee. 
he, the king, being placed in our power, will do whatever we like. Others there said, when the king will sport in the waters, we will carry him to our home and bind him, so that that sacrifice will not take place. Other serpents who deemed themselves wise, said, approaching the king, let us bite him, so that our object will be accomplished. By his death the root of all evil will be torn up. This is the final deliberation of us all, O thou who hearest with thy eyes. Then, do speedily what thou deemest proper. Having said this, they looked intently at Vasuki, that best of snakes. And Vasuki also, after reflecting, answered saying, Ye snakes, this final determination of you doth not seem worthy of adoption. The advice of you all is not to my liking. What shall I say which would be for your good? I think the grace of the illustrious Kasyapa, our father, can alone do us good. Ye snakes, my heart doth not know which of all your suggestions is to be adopted for the welfare of my race is also of me. That must be done by me which would be to your weal. It is this that makes me so anxious, for the credit or the discredit, of the measure, is mine alone. So ends the 37th section in the Astika Parva of the Adi Parva. Adi Parva section 38. Saudi said, Hearing the respective speeches of all the snakes, and hearing also the words of Vasuki, Elipatra began to address them, saying, that sacrifice is not one that can be prevented. Nor is King Janamejaya of the Pandava race from whom this fear proceedeth, such that he can be hindered. The person, O king, who is afflicted by fate hath recourse to fate alone. Nothing else can be his refuge. Ye best of snakes, this fear of ours hath fate for its root. Fate alone must be our refuge in this. Listen to what I say. When that curse was uttered, ye best of snakes, in fear I lay crouching on the lap of our mother. Ye best of snakes, and O Lord, Vasuki, of great splendor, from that place I heard the words the sorrowing gods spake unto the grandsire. The god said, O grandsire, thou god of gods who else than the cruel Kadru could thus, after getting such dear children, curse them so, even in thy presence? And, O grandsire, by thee also hath been spoken, with reference to those words of hers, be it so. We wish to know the reason why thou didst not prevent her. Brahman replied, The snakes have multiplied. They are cruel, terrible in form and highly poisonous. From desire of the good of my creatures, I did not prevent Kadru then. Those poisonous serpents and others who are sinful, biting others for no faults, shall, indeed, be destroyed, but not they who are harmless and virtuous. And here also, how, when the hour comes, the snakes may escape this dreadful calamity. There shall be bomb in the race of the Yayavaras a great rishi known by the name of Jaratkam, intelligent, with passions under complete control. That Jaratkam shall have a son of the name of Astaka. He shall put a stop to that sacrifice. And those snakes who shall be virtuous shall escape therefrom. The god said, O thou truth knowing one, on whom will Jaratkam, that foremost Muni, gifted with great energy and asceticism, beget that illustrious son? Brahma answered, gifted with great energy, that best Brahmana shall beget a son possessed of great energy on a wife of the same name as his. Vasuki, the king of the snakes, hath a sister of the name of Jaratkam. The son, of whom I speak, shall be born of her, and he shall liberate the snakes. Elipatra continued, the gods then said unto the grandsire, be it so. And the Lord Brahman, having said so unto the gods, went to heaven. O Vasuki, I see before me that sister of thine known by the name of Jaratkam. For relieving us from fear, give her as alms unto him, i.e., the Rishi, Jaratkam, of excellent vows, who shall roam a begging for a bride. This means of release hath been heard of by me. Adi Parva section 39. Saudi said, O best of regenerate ones, hearing these words of Elipatra, all the serpents, in great delight, exclaimed, Well said, well said. And from that time Vasuki set about carefully bringing up that maiden, viz. his sister Jarakaru. And he took great delight in rearing her. And much time did not elapse from this, when the gods and the Asuras, assembling together, churned the abode of Varuna. And Vasuki, the foremost of all gifted with strength, became the churning cord. And directly the work was over, the king of the snakes presented himself before the grandsire. And the gods, accompanied by Vasuki, addressed the grandsire, saying, O Lord, Vasuki is suffering great affliction from fear of, his mother's curse. It behoveth thee to root out the sorrow, 
begotten of the curse of his mother, that hath pierced the heart of Vasuki desirous of the wheel of his race. The king of the snakes is ever our friend and benefactor. O lord of the gods, be gracious unto him and assuage his mind's fever. Brahman replied, O ye immortals, I have thought, in my mind, of what ye have said. Let the king of the snakes do that which hath been communicated to him before by Elipatra. The time hath arrived. Those only shall be destroyed that are wicked, not those that are virtuous. Jaratkaru hath been born, and that Brahmana is engaged in hard ascetic penances. Let Vasuki, at the proper time, bestow on him his sister. Ye gods, what hath been spoken by the snake Elipatra for the wheel of the snakes is true and not otherwise. Saudi continued. Then the king of the snakes, Vasuki, afflicted with the curse of his mother, hearing these words of the grandsire, and intending to bestow his sister of the Rishi Jarakaru, commanded all the serpents, a large numbers of whom were ever attentive to their duties, to watch the Rishi Jarakaru, saying, When the Lord Jarakaru will ask for a wife, come immediately and inform me of it. The wheel of our race depends upon it. Adi Parva Section 40. Sonika said, O son of Suda, I desire to know the reason why the illustrious Rishi whom thou hast named Jarakaru came to be so called on earth. It behoveth thee to tell us the etymology of the name Jarakaru. Saudi said, Hara is said to mean waste, and Karu implies huge. This Rishi's body had been huge, and he gradually reduced it by severe ascetic penances. For the same reason, O Brahmanas, the sister of Vasuki was called Jarakaru. The virtuous Sonika, when he heard this, smiled and addressing Yugrasrava said, It is even so. Sonika then said, I have heard all that thou hast before recited. I desire to know how Astika was born. Saudi, on hearing these words, began to relate according to what was written in the Sastras. Saudi said, Vasuki, desirous of bestowing his sister upon the Rishi Jarakaru, gave the snakes, necessary, orders. But days went on. Yet that wise muni of rigid vows, deeply engaged in ascetic devotions, did not seek for a wife. That high-souled Rishi, engaged in studies and deeply devoted to asceticism, his vital seed under full control, fearlessly wandered over the whole earth and had no wish for a wife. Afterwards, once upon a time, there was a king, O Brahmana, of the name of Parikshit, born in the race of the Kauravas. And, like his great not grandfather Pandu of old, he was of mighty arms the first of all bearers of bows in battle, and fond of hunting. And the monarch wandered about, hunting deer, and wild boars, and wolves, and buffaloes and various other kinds of wild animals. One day, having pierced a deer with a sharp arrow and slung his bow on his back, he penetrated into the deep forest, searching for the animal here and there, like the illustrious Rudra himself of old pursuing in the heavens, bow in hand, the deer which was sacrifice, itself turned into that shape, after the piercing. No deer that was pierced by Parikshit had ever escaped in the wood with life. This deer, however wounded as before, fled with speed, as the proximate cause of the king's attainment to heaven. And the deer that Parikshit, that king of men, had pierced was lost to his gaze and drew the monarch far away into the forest. And fatigued and thirsty, he came across a muni, in the forest, seated in a cow pen and drinking to his fill the froth oozing out of the mouths of calves sucking the milk of their dams. And approaching him hastily, the monarch, hungry and fatigued, and raising his bow, asked that muni of rigid vows, saying, O Brahmana, I am King Parikshit, the son of Abhimanu. A deer pierced by me hath been lost. Hast thou seen it? But that muni observing then the vow of silence, spoke not unto him a word. And the king in anger thereupon placed upon his shoulder a dead snake, taking it up with the end of his bow. The muni suffered him to do it without protest. And he spoke not a word, good or bad. And the king seeing him in that state, cast off his anger and became sorry. And he returned to his capital but the Rishi continued in the same state. The forgiving Muni, knowing that the monarch who was a tiger amongst kings was true to the duties of his order, cursed him not, though insulted. That tiger amongst monarchs, that foremost one of Bharata's race, also did not know that the person whom he had so insulted was a virtuous Rishi. It was for this that he had so insulted him. That Rishi had a son by name Shringan, of tender years, gifted with great energy, deep in ascetic penances, severe in his vows, very wrathful, and difficult to be appeased. 
At times, he worshipped with great attention and respect his preceptor seated with ease on his seat and ever engaged in the good of creatures. And commanded by his preceptor, he was coming home when, O oh best of Brahmanas, a companion of his, a rishi's son named Krissa in a playful mood laughingly spoke unto him. And Shringan, wrathful and like unto poison itself, hearing these words in reference to his father, blazed up in rage. And Krissa said, Be not proud, O Shringan, for ascetic as thou art and possessed of energy, thy father bears on his shoulders a dead snake. Henceforth speak not a word to sons of rishis like ourselves who have knowledge of the truth, are deep in ascetic penances, and have attained success. Where is that manliness of thine, those high words of thine begotten of pride, when thou must have to behold thy father bearing a dead snake? O best of all the munis, thy father too had done nothing to deserve this treatment, and it is for this that I am particularly sorry as if the punishment were mine. Adi Parva Section 41. Saudi said, being thus addressed, and hearing that his sire was bearing a dead snake, the powerful Shringan burned with wrath. And looking at Krissa, and speaking softly, he asked him, Pray, why doth my father bear today a dead snake? And Krissa replied, Even as King Parikshit was roving, for purpose of hunting, O oh dear one, he placed the dead snake on the shoulder of thy sire. And Shringan asked, What wrong was done to that wicked monarch by my father? O oh Krissa, tell me this, and witness the power of my asceticism. And Krissa answered, King Parikshit, the son of Abhimanu, while hunting, had wounded a fleet stag with an arrow and chased it alone. And the king lost sight of the animal in that extensive wilderness. Seeing then thy sire, he immediately accosted him. Thy sire was then observing the vow of silence. Oppressed by hunger, thirst and labor, the prince again and again asked thy sire sitting motionless, about the missing deer. The sage, being under the vow of silence, returned no reply. The king thereupon placed the snake on thy sire's shoulder with the end of his bow. O Shringan, thy sire engaged in devotion is in the same posture still. And the king also hath gone to his capital which is named after the elephant. Saudi continued, having heard of a dead snake placed upon his, father's, shoulders, the son of the Rishi, his eyes reddened with anger, blazed up with rage. And possessed by anger, the puissant Rishi then cursed the king, touching water and overcome with wrath. And Shringan said, That sinful wretch of a monarch who hath placed a dead snake on the shoulders of my lean and old parent, that insulter of Brahmanas and tarnisher of the fame of the Kurus, shall be taken within seven nights hence to the regions of Yama, death, by the snake Tikshaka, the powerful king of serpents, stimulated thereto by the strength of my words. Saudi continued, and having thus cursed, the king, from anger, Shringan went to his father, and saw the sage sitting in the cowpen, bearing the dead snake. And seeing his parent in that plight, he was again inflamed with ire. And he shed tears of grief, and addressed his sire, saying, Father, having been informed of this thy disgrace at the hands of that wicked wretch, King Parikshit, I have from anger even cursed him, and that worst of Kurus hath richly deserved my potent curse. Seven days hence, Tikshaka, the lord of snakes, shall take the sinful king to the horrible abode of death. And the father said to the enraged son, Child, I am not pleased with thee. Ascetics should not act thus. We live in the domains of that great king. We are protected by him righteously. In all he does, the reigning king should by the like of us forgiven. If thou destroy Dharma, verily Dharma will destroy thee. If the king do not properly protect us, we fare very ill. We cannot perform our religious rites according to our desire. But protected by righteous sovereigns, we attain immense merit, and they are entitled to a share thereof. Therefore, reigning royalty is by all means to be forgiven. And Parikshit like unto his great grandsire, protecteth us as a king should protect his subjects. That penance practicing monarch was fatigued and oppressed with hunger. Ignorant of my vow, of silence, he did this. A kingless country always suffereth from evils. The king punisheth offenders, and fear of punishments conducteth to peace, and people do their duties and perform their rites undisturbed. The king establisheth religion, establisheth the kingdom of heaven. The king protecteth sacrifices from disturbance, and sacrifices to please the gods. The gods cause rain, and rain produced grains and herbs, which are always useful to man. Manu saith, a ruler of the destinies of men is equal, in dignity, to ten Veda-studying priests. Fatigued and oppressed with hunger, 
that penance practicing prince hath done this through ignorance of my vow. Why then hast thou rashly done this unrighteous action through childishness? O son, in no way doth the king deserve a curse from us. Adi Parva section 42. Saudi said, and Shringan then replied to his father, saying, Whether this be an act of rashness, O father, or an improper act that I have done, whether thou lickest it or dislikest it, the words spoken by me shall never be in vain. O father, I tell thee, a curse, can never be otherwise. I have never spoken a lie even in jest. And Samika said, Dear child, I know that thou art of great prowess and truthful in speech. Thou hast never spoken falsehood before, so that thy curse shall never be falsified. The son, even when he attaineth to age, should yet be always counseled by the father, so that crowned with good qualities he may acquire great renown. A child as thou art, how much more dost thou stand in need of counsel? Thou art ever engaged in ascetic penances. The wrath of even the illustrious ones possessing the six attributes increaseth greatly. O thou foremost of ordinance observing persons, seeing that thou art my son and a minor too, and beholding also thy rashness, I see that I must counsel thee. Live thou, O son, inclined to peace and eating fruits and roots of the forest. Kill this thy anger and destroy not the fruit of thy ascetic acts in this way. Wrath surely decreaseth the virtue that ascetics acquire with great pains. And then for those deprived of virtue, the blessed state existeth not. Peacefulness ever giveth success to forgiving ascetics. Therefore, becoming forgiving in thy temper and conquering thy passions, shouldst thou always live. By forgiveness shalt thou obtain worlds that are beyond the reach of Brahman himself. Having adopted peacefulness myself, and with a desire also for doing good as much as lies in my power, I must do something. Even must I send to that king, telling him, O monarch, thou hast been cursed by my son of tender years and undeveloped intellect, in wrath, at seeing thy act of disrespect towards myself. Saudi continued, and that great ascetic, observer of vows, moved by kindness, sent with proper instructions a disciple of his to King Parikshit. And he sent his disciple Garmuka of good manners and engaged also in ascetic penances, instructing him to first inquire about the welfare of the king and then to communicate the real message. And that disciple soon approached that monarch, the head of the Kuru race. And he entered the king's palace having first sent notice of his arrival through the servant in attendance at the gate. And the twice-born Garmuka was duly worshipped by the monarch. And after resting for a while, he detailed fully to the king, in the presence of his ministers, the words of Samika, of cruel import, exactly as he had been instructed. And Garmuka said, O king of kings, there is a Rishi, Samika, by name, a virtuous soul, his passions under control, peaceful, and given up to hard ascetic devotions, living in thy dominions. By thee, O tiger among men, was placed on the shoulders of that Rishi observing at present the vow of silence, a dead snake, with the end of thy bow. He himself forgave thee that act. But his son could not. And by the latter hast thou today been cursed, O king of kings, without the knowledge of his father, to the effect that within seven nights hence, shall, the snake, Tikshaka cause thy death. And Samika repeatedly asked his son to save thee, but there is none to falsify his son's curse. And because he hath been unable to pacify his son possessed by anger, therefore have I been sent to thee, O king, for thy good. And that king of the Kuru race, himself engaged in ascetic practices, having heard these cruel words and recollecting his own sinful act, became exceedingly sorry. And the king, learning that foremost of rishis in the forest had been observing the vow of silence, was doubly afflicted with sorrow and seeing the kindness of the rishi Samika, and considering his own sinful act towards him, the king became very repentant. And the king looking like a very god, did not grieve so much for hearing of his death as for having done that act to the rishi. And then the king sent away Garmuka, saying, Let the worshipful one, Samika, be gracious to me. And when Garmuka had gone away, the king, in great anxiety, without loss of time, consulted his ministers. And having consulted them, the king, himself wise in councils, caused a mansion to be erected upon one solitary column. It was well guarded day and night. And for its protection were placed their physicians and medicines, and brahmanas skilled in mantras all around. And the monarch, protected on all sides, discharged his kingly duties from that place surrounded by his virtuous ministers. And no one could approach that best of kings there. The heir even could not go there, being prevented from entering. 
and when the seventh day had arrived, that best of Brahmanas, the learned Kasyapa was coming, towards the king's residence, desirous of treating the king, after the snake bite. He had heard all that had taken place, viz. That Tikshaka, that first of snakes, would send that best of monarchs to the presence of Yama, death. And he thought, I would cure the monarch after he is bit by that first of snakes. By that I may have wealth and may acquire virtue also. But that prince of snakes, Tikshaka, in the form of an old Brahmana, saw Kasyapa approaching on his way, his heart set upon curing the king. And the prince of snakes then spake unto that bull among munis, Kasyapa, saying, Whither dost thou go with such speed? What, besides, is the business upon which thou art intent? And Kasyapa, thus addressed, replied, Tikshaka, by his poison, will today burn King Parikshit of the Kuru race, that oppressor of all enemies. I go with speed, O amiable one, to cure, without loss of time, the king of immeasurable prowess, the sole representative of the Pandava race, after he is bit by the same Tikshaka like to Agni himself in energy. And Tikshaka answered, I am that Tikshaka, O Brahmana, who shall burn that lord of the earth. Stop, for thou art unable to cure one bit by me. And Kasyapa rejoined, I am sure that, possessed, that I am, of the power of learning, going thither I shall cure that monarch bit by thee. Adi Parva section 43. Saudi said, and Tikshaka, after this, answered, if, indeed, thou art able to cure any creature bitten by me, then, O Kasyapa, revive thou this tree bit by me. O best of Brahmanas, I bum this banyan in thy sight. Try thy best and show me that skill in mantras of which thou hast spoken. And Kasyapa said, If thou art so minded, bite thou then, O king of snakes, this tree. O snake, I shall revive it, though bit by thee. Saudi continued, That king of snakes, thus addressed by the illustrious Kasyapa, bit then that banyan tree. And that tree, bit by the illustrious snake, and penetrated by the poison of the serpent, blazed up all around. And having burnt the banyan so, the snake then spake again unto Kasyapa, saying, O first of Brahmanas, try thy best and revive this lord of the forest. Saudi continued, the tree was reduced to ashes by the poison of that king of snakes. But taking up those ashes, Kasyapa spoke these words, O king of snakes, behold the power of my knowledge as applied to this lord of the forest. O snake, under thy very nose I shall revive it. And then that best of Brahmanas, the illustrious and learned Kasyapa, revived, by his vidya, that tree which had been reduced to a heap of ashes. And first he created the sprout, then he furnished it with two leaves, and then he made the stem, and then the branches, and then the full-grown tree with leaves and all. And Tikshaka, seeing the tree revived by the illustrious Kasyapa, said unto him, It is not wonderful in thee that thou shouldst destroy my poison or that of anyone else like myself. O thou whose wealth is asceticism, desirous of what wealth, goest thou thither? The reward thou hoppest to have from that best of monarchs, even I will give thee, however difficult it may be to obtain it. Decked with fame as thou art, thy success may be doubtful on that king affected by a Brahmana's curse and whose span of life itself hath been shortened. In that case, this blazing fame of thine that hath overspread the three worlds will disappear like the sun when deprived of his splendor, on the occasion of the eclipse. Kasyapa said, I go there for wealth, give it unto me, O snake, so that taking thy gold, I may return. Tikshaka replied, O best of regenerate ones, even I will give thee more than what thou expectest from that king. Therefore do not go. Saudi continued, that best of Brahmanas, Kasyapa, of great prowess and intelligence, hearing those words of Tikshaka, sat in yoga meditation over the king. And that foremost of Munis, viz. Kasyapa, of great prowess and gifted with spiritual knowledge, ascertaining that the period of life of that king of the Pandava race had really run out, returned, receiving from Tikshaka as much wealth as he desired. And upon the illustrious Kasyapa's retracing his steps, Tikshaka at the proper time speedily entered the city of Hastinapura. And on his way he heard that the king was living very cautiously, protected by means of poison neutralizing mantras and medicines. Saudi continued, the snake thereupon reflected thus, the monarch must be deceived by me with power of illusion. But what must be the means? Then Tikshaka sent to the king some snakes in the guise of ascetics taking with them fruits, kusa grass, and water, as presents. 
and Takshaka, addressing them, said, Go ye all to the king, on the pretext of pressing business, without any sign of impatience, as if to make the monarch only accept the fruits and flowers and water, that ye shall carry as presents unto him. Saudi continued, Those snakes, thus commanded by Takshaka, acted accordingly. And they took to the king, kusa grass and water, and fruits. And that foremost of kings, of great prowess, accepted those offerings. And after their business was finished, he said up to them, Retire. Then after those snakes disguised as ascetics had gone away, the king addressed his ministers and friends, saying, Eat ye, with me, all these fruits of excellent taste brought by the ascetics. Impelled by fate and the words of the Rishi, the king, with his ministers, felt the desire of eating those fruits. The particular fruit, within which Takshaka had entered, was taken by the king himself for eating. And when he was eating it, there appeared, O Sonika, an ugly insect out of it, of shape scarcely discernible, of eyes black, and of coppery color. And that foremost of kings, taking that insect, addressed his counselors, saying, The sun is setting. Today I have no more tear from poison. Therefore, let this insect become Takshaka and bite me, so that my sinful act may be expiated and the words of the ascetic rendered true. And those counselors also, impelled by fate, approved of that speech. And then the monarch smiled, losing his senses, his hour having come. And he quickly placed that insect on his neck. And as the king was smiling, Takshaka, who had, in the form of that insect, come out of the fruit that had been offered to the king, coiled himself round the neck of the monarch. And quickly coiling round the king's neck and uttering a tremendous roar, Takshaka, that lord of snakes, bit that protector of the earth. Adi Parva Section 44. Saudi said, Then the counselors beholding the king in the coils of Takshaka, became pale with fear and wept in exceeding grief. And hearing the roar of Takshaka, the ministers all fled. And as they were flying away in great grief, they saw Takshaka, the king of snakes, that wonderful serpent, coursing through the blue sky like a streak of the hue of the lotus, and looking very much like the vermilion-colored line on a woman's crown dividing the dark masses of her hair in the middle. And the mansion in which the king was living blazed up with Takshaka's poison. And the king's counselors, on beholding it, fled away in all directions. And the king himself fell down, as if struck by lightning. And when the king was laid low by Takshaka's poison, his counselors with the royal priest, a holy brahmana, performed all his last rites. All the citizens, assembling together, made the minor son of the deceased monarch their king. And the people called their new king, that slayer of all enemies, that hero of the Kuru race, by the name of Janamejaya. And that best of monarchs, Janamejaya, though a child, was wise in mind. And with his counselors and priest, the eldest son Parikshita, that bull amongst the Kurus, ruled the kingdom like his heroic great-grandfather, Yudhishthira. And the ministers of the youthful monarch, beholding that he could now keep his enemies in check, went to Suvarnavarman, the king of Kasi, and asked him his daughter Vaipushtama for a bride. And the king of Kasi, after due inquiries, bestowed with ordained rites, his daughter Vaipushtama on that mighty hero of Kuru race. And the latter, receiving his bride, became exceedingly glad. And he gave not his heart at any time to any other woman. And gifted with great energy, he wandered in pursuit of pleasure, with a cheerful heart, on expanses of water and amid woods and flowery fields. And that first of monarchs passed his time in pleasure as Pureravas of old did, on receiving the celestial damsel Urvasi. Herself fairest of the fair, the damsel Vaipushtama too, devoted to her lord and celebrated for her beauty having gained a desirable husband, pleased him by the excess of her affection during the period he spent in the pursuit of pleasure. Adi Parva Section 45. Meanwhile the great ascetic Jaratkaru wandered over the whole earth making the place where evening fell his home for the night. And gifted with ascetic power, he roamed, practicing various vows difficult to be practiced by the immature, and bathing also in various sacred waters. And the Muni had air alone for his food and was free from desire of worldly enjoyment. And he became daily emaciated and grew lean-fleshed. And one day he saw the spirits of his ancestors, heads down, in a hole, by a cord of varana roots having only one thread entire. And that even single thread was being gradually eaten away by a large rat dwelling in that hole. And the petris in that hole were without food, emaciated, pitiable, and eagerly desirous of salvation. 
and Jaratkaru, approaching the pitiable one, himself in humble guise, asked them, Who are ye hanging by this cord of Varana roots? The single weak root that is still left in this cord of Varana roots already eaten away by the rat, dwelling in this hole, is itself being gradually eaten away by the same rat with his sharp teeth. The little that remains of that single thread will soon be cut away. It is clear ye shall then have to fall down into this pit with faces downwards. Seeing you with faces downwards, and overtaken by this great calamity, my pity hath been excited. What good can I do to you? Tell me quickly whether this calamity can be averted by a fourth, a third, or even by the sacrifice of a half of this my asceticism. Oh, relieve yourselves even with the whole of my asceticism. I consent to all this. Do ye as ye please. The Petri said, Venerable Brahmacharan, thou desirest to relieve us. But, O foremost of Brahmanas, thou canst not dispel our affliction by thy asceticism. O child, O first of speakers, we too have the fruits of our asceticism. But, O Brahmana, it is for the loss of children that we are falling down into this unholy hell. The grandsire himself hath said that a son is a great merit. As we are about to be cast in this hole, our ideas are no longer clear. Therefore, O child, we know thee not, although thy manhood is well known on earth. Venerable thou art and of good fortune, thou who thus from kindness grievest for us worthy of pity and greatly afflicted. O Brahmana, listen, who we are. We are rishis of the Yayavara sect, of rigid vows. And, O Muni, from loss of children, we have fallen down from a sacred region. Our severe penances have not been destroyed, we have a thread yet. But we have only one thread now. It matters little, however, whether he is or is not. Unfortunate as we are, we have a thread in one, known as Jaratkaru. The unfortunate one has gone through the Vedas and their branches and is practicing asceticism alone. He being one with soul under complete control, desire set high, observant of vows, deeply engaged in ascetic penances, and free from greed for the merits or asceticism, we have been reduced to this deplorable state. He hath no wife, no son, no relatives. Therefore, do we hang in this hole, our consciousness lost, like men having none to take care of them. If thou meetest him, oh, tell him, from thy kindness to ourselves, thy petries, in sorrow, are hanging with faces downwards in a hole. Holy one, take a wife and beget children. O thou of ascetic wealth, thou art, O amiable one, the only thread that remaineth in the line of thy ancestors. O Brahmana, the cord of Varana roots that thou seest we are hanging by is the cord representing our multiplied race. And, O Brahmana, these threads of the cord of Varana roots that thou seest as eaten away, are ourselves who have been eaten up by time. This root thou seest hath been half eaten and by which we are hanging in this hole is he that hath adopted asceticism alone. The rat that thou beholdest is time of infinite strength. And he, time, is gradually weakening the wretch Jaratkaru engaged in ascetic penances tempted by the merits thereof but wanting in prudence and heart. O oh, excellent one, his asceticism cannot save us. Behold, our roots being Tom, cast down from higher regions, deprived of consciousness by time, we are going downwards like sinful wretches. And upon our going down into this hole with all our relatives, eaten up by time, even he shall sink with us into hell. O oh, child, whether it is asceticism, or sacrifice, or whatever else there be of very holy acts, everything is inferior. These cannot count with a son. O child, having seen all, speak unto that Jaratkaru of ascetic wealth. Thou shouldst tell him in detail everything that thou hast beheld. And, O Brahmana, from thy kindness towards us, thou shouldst tell him all that would induce him to take a wife and beget children. Amongst his friends, or of our own race, who art thou, O excellent one, that thus grievest for us all like a friend? We wish to hear who thou art that stayest here. Adi Parva section 46. Saudi said. Jaratkaru, hearing all this, became excessively dejected. And from sorrow he spoke unto those Petris in words obstructed by tears. And Jaratkaru said, Ye are even my fathers and grandfathers gone before. Therefore, tell me what I must do for your welfare. I am that sinful son of yours, Jaratkaru. Punish me for my sinful deeds, a wretch that I am. The Petris replied, saying, O son, by good luck hast thou arrived at this spot in course of thy rambles. O Brahmana, why hast thou not taken a wife? Jaratkaru said, Ye Petris, this desire hath always existed in my heart that I would, with vital seed drawn up, 
carry this body to the other world. My mind hath been possessed with the idea that I would not take a wife. But ye grandsires, having seen you hanging like birds, I have diverted my mind from the brahmacharya mode of life. I will truly do what you like. I will certainly marry, if ever I meet with a maiden of my own name. I shall accept her who, bestowing herself of her own accord, will be as aims unto me, and whom I shall not have to maintain. I shall marry if I get such a one, otherwise, I shall not. This is the truth, ye grandsires. And the offspring that will be begot upon her shall be your salvation. And ye petries of mine, ye shall live forever in blessedness and without fear. Saudi continued, the Muni, having said so unto the petries, wandered over the earth again. And, O Sonica, being old, he obtained no wife. And he grieved much that he was not successful. But directed, as before, by his ancestors, he continued the search. And going into the forest, he wept loudly in great grief. And having gone into the forest, the wise one, moved by the desire of doing good to his ancestors, said, I will ask for a bride, distinctly repeating these words thrice. And he said, Whatever creatures are here, mobile and immobile, so whoever there be that are invisible, oh, hear my words. My ancestors, afflicted with grief, have directed me that am engaged in the most severe penances, saying, Marry thou for, the acquisition of, a son. O ye, being directed by my ancestors, I am roaming in poverty and sorrow, over the wide world for wedding a maiden that I may obtain as alms. Let that creature, amongst those I have addressed, who hath a daughter, bestow on me that am roaming far and near. Such a bride as is of same name with me, to be bestowed on me as alms, and whom, besides, I shall not maintain, O bestow on me. Then those snakes that had been set upon Jarakaru track, ascertaining his inclination, gave information to Vasuki. And the king of the snakes, hearing their words, took with him that maiden decked with ornaments, and went into the forest unto that Rishi. And, O Brahmana, Vasuki, the king of the snakes, having gone there, offered that maiden as alms unto that high-souled Rishi. But the Rishi did not at once accept her. And the Rishi, thinking her not to be of the same name with himself, and seeing that the question of her maintenance also was unsettled, reflected for a few moments, hesitating to accept her. And then, O son of Brigu, he asked Vasuki the maiden's name, and also said unto him, I shall not maintain her. Adi Parva section 47. Saudi said, Then Vasuki spake unto the Rishi Jarakaru these words, O best of Brahmanas, this maiden is of the same name with thee. She is my sister and hath ascetic merit. I will maintain thy wife, accept her. O thou of ascetic wealth, I shall protect her with all my ability. And, O foremost of the great munis, she hath been reared by me for thee. And the Rishi replied, This is agreed between us that I shall not maintain her and she shall not do aught that I do not like. If she do, I leave her. Saudi continued, when the snake had promised, saying, I shall maintain my sister, Jaratkaru then went to the snake's house. Then that first of mantra knowing Brahmanas, observing rigid vows, that virtuous and veteran ascetic, took her hand presented to him according to Shastric rites. And taking his bride with him, adored by the great Rishi, he entered the delightful chamber set apart for him by the king of the snakes. And in that chamber was a bedstead covered with very valuable coverlets. And Jaratkaru lived there with his wife. And the excellent Rishi made an agreement with his wife, saying, Nothing must ever be done or said by thee that is against my liking. And in case of thy doing any such thing, I will leave thee and no longer continue to stay in thy house. Bear in mind these words that have been spoken by me. And then the sister of the king of the snakes in great anxiety and grieving exceedingly, spoke unto him, saying, Be it so. And moved by the desire of doing good to her relatives, that damsel, of unsullied reputation, began to attend upon her lord with the wakefulness of a dog, the timidity of a deer, and knowledge of signs possessed by the crow. And one day, after the menstrual period, the sister of Vasuki, having purified herself by a bath according to custom, approached her lord the great Muni, and thereupon she conceived. And the embryo was like unto a flame of fire, possessed of great energy, and resplendent as fire itself and it grew like the moon in the bright fortnight. And one day, within a short time, Jarakaru of great fame, placing his head on the lap of his wife, slept, looking like one fatigued. And as he was sleeping, the sun entered his chambers in the western mountain and was about to set. 
and, O oh Brahmana, as the day was fading, she, the excellent sister of Vasuki, became thoughtful, fearing the loss of her husband's virtue. And she thought, what should I now do? Shall I wake my husband or not? He is exacting and punctilious in his religious duties. How can I act as not to offend him? The alternatives are his anger and the loss of virtue of a virtuous man. The loss of virtue, I ween, is the greater of the two evils. Again, if I wake him, he will be angry. But if twilight passeth away without his prayers being said, he shall certainly sustain loss of virtue. And having resolved at last, the sweet speech Jaratkaru, the sister of Vasuki, spake softly unto that Rishi resplendent with ascetic penances, and lying prostrate like a flame of fire. O thou of great good fortune, awake, the sun is setting. O thou of rigid vows, O illustrious one, do your evening prayer after purifying yourself with water and uttering the name of Vishnu. The time for the evening sacrifice hath come. Twilight, O Lord, is even now gently covering the western side. The illustrious Jaratkaru of great ascetic merit, thus addressed, spake unto his wife these words, his upper lip quivering in anger, O amiable one of the Naga race, thou hast insulted me. I shall no longer abide with thee, but shall go where I came from. O thou of beautiful thighs, I believe in my heart that the sun hath no power to set in the usual time, if I am asleep. An insulted person should never live where he hath met with the insult, far less should I, a virtuous person, or those that are like me. Jaratkaru, the sister of Vasuki, thus addressed by her lord, began to quake with terror, and she spake unto him, saying, O Brahmana, I have not waked thee from desire of insult, but I have done it so that thy virtue may not sustain any loss. The Rishi Jaratkaru, great in ascetic merit, possessed with anger and desirous of forsaking his spouse, thus addressed, spake unto his wife, saying, O thou fair one, never have I spoken a falsehood. Therefore, go I shall. This was also settled between ourselves. O amiable one, I have passed the time happily with thee. And, O fair one, tell thy brother, when I am gone, that I have left thee. And upon my going away, it behoveth thee not to grieve for me. Thus addressed Jaratkaru, the fair sister of Vasuki, of faultless features, filled with anxiety and sorrow, having mustered sufficient courage and patience, though her heart was still quaking, then spake unto Rishi Jaratkaru. Her words were obstructed with tears and her face was pale with fear. And the palms of her hands were joined together, and her eyes were bathed in tears. And she said, It behoveth thee not to leave me without a fault. Thou treadest over the path of virtue. I too have been in the same path, with heart fixed on the good of my relatives. O best of Brahmanas, the object for which I was bestowed on thee hath not been accomplished yet. Unfortunate that I am, what shall Vasuki say unto me? O excellent one, the offspring desired of by my relatives afflicted by a mother's curse, do not yet appear. The welfare of my relatives dependeth on the acquisition of offspring from thee. And in order that my connection with thee may not be fruitless, O illustrious Brahmana, Moved by the desire of doing good to my race do I entreat thee. O excellent one, high-souled thou art. So why shall thou leave me who am faultless? This is what is not just clear to me. Thus addressed, the Muni of great ascetic merit spake unto his wife Jaratkaru these words that were proper and suitable to the occasion. And he said, O fortunate one, the being thou hast conceived, even like unto Agni himself as a rishi of soul highly virtuous, and a master of the Vedas and their branches. Having said so, the great Rishi, Jaratkaru of virtuous soul, went away, his heart firmly fixed on practicing again the severest penances. Adi Parva Section 48. Saudi said, O thou of ascetic wealth, soon after her lord had left her, Jaratkaru went to her brother. And she told him everything that had happened. And the prince of snakes, Hearing the calamitous news, spake unto his miserable sister, himself more miserable still. And he said, Thou knowest, O amiable one, the purpose of thy bestowal, the reason thereof. If, from that union, for the welfare of the snakes, a son be born, then he, possessed of energy, will save us all from the snake sacrifice. The grandsire had said so, of old, in the midst of the gods. O fortunate one, hast thou conceived from thy union with that best of rishis? My heart's desire is that my bestowal of thee on that wise one may not be fruitless. Truly, it is not proper for me to ask thee about this. But from the gravity of the interests I ask thee this. Knowing also the obstinacy of thy lord, 
ever engaged in severe penances, I shall not follow him, for he may curse me. Tell me in detail all that thy Lord, O amiable one, hath done, and extract that terribly afflicting dart that lies implanted for a long time past in my heart. Jaratkaru, thus addressed, consoling Vasuki, the king of the snakes, at length replied, saying, asked by me about offspring, the high-souled and mighty ascetic said, there is, and then he went away. I do not remember him to have ever before speak even in jest aught that is false. Why should he, O king, speak a falsehood on such a serious occasion? He said, Thou shouldst not grieve, O daughter of the snake race, about the intended result of our union. A son shall be bombed to thee, resplendent as the blazing sun. O brother, having said this to me, my husband of ascetic wealth went away. Therefore, let the deep sorrow cherished in thy heart disappear. Saudi continued, thus addressed, Vasuki, the king of the snakes, accepted those words of his sister, and in great joy said, Be it so. And the chief of the snakes then adored his sister with his best regards, gift of wealth, and fitting eulogies. Then, O best of Brahmanas, the embryo endued with great splendor, began to develop, like the moon in the heavens in the bright fortnight. And in due time, the sister of the snakes, O Brahmana, gave birth to a son of the splendor of a celestial child who became the reliever of the fears of his ancestors and maternal relatives. The child grew up there in the house of the king of the snakes. He studied the Vedas and their branches with the ascetic Chayavana, the son of Brigu. And though but a boy, his vows were rigid. And he was gifted with great intelligence, and with the several attributes of virtue, knowledge, freedom from the world's indulgences, and saintliness. And the name by which he was known to the world was Astika. And he was known by the name of Astika, whoever is, because his father had gone to the woods, saying, There is, when he was in the womb. Though but a boy, he had great gravity and intelligence. And he was reared with great care in the palace of the snakes. And he was like the illustrious lord of the celestials, Mahadeva of the golden form, the wielder of the trident. And he grew up day by day, the delight of all the snakes. Adi Parva section 49. Sonika said, Tell me again, in detail, all that King Janamejaya had asked his ministers about his father's ascension to heaven. Saudi said, O Brahmana, hear all that the king asked his ministers, and all that they said about the death of Parikshit. Janamejaya asked, Know ye all that befell my father? How did that famous king, in time, meet with his death? Hearing from you the incidents of my father's life in detail, I shall ordain something if it be for the benefit of the world. Otherwise, I shall do nothing. The minister replied, Hear, O monarch, what thou hast asked, viz. An account of thy illustrious father's life, and how also that king of kings left this world. Thy father was virtuous and high-souled, and always protected his people. Oh, hear, how that high-souled one conducted himself on earth. Like unto an impersonation of virtue and justice, the monarch, cognizant of virtue, virtuously protected the four orders, each engaged in the discharge of their specified duties. Of incomparable prowess, and blessed with fortune, he protected the goddess earth. There was none who hated him and he himself hated none. Like unto Prajapati, Brahma, he was equally disposed towards all creatures. O monarch, Brahmanas and Kshatriyas and Vaisyas and Sudras, all engaged contentedly in the practice of their respective duties, were impartially protected by that king. Widows and orphans, the maimed and the poor, he maintained. Of handsome features, he was unto all creatures like a second Soma. Cherishing his subjects and keeping them contented, blessed with good fortune, truth-telling, of immense prowess, he was the disciple of Saradwit in the science of arms. And, O Janamejaya, thy father was dear unto Govinda. Of great fame, he was loved by all men. And he was born in the womb of Uttara when the Kuru race was almost extinct. And, therefore, the mighty son of Abhimanu came to be called Parikshit, born in an extinct line. Well versed in the interpretation of treatises on the duties of kings, he was gifted with every virtue. With passions under complete control, intelligent, possessing a retentive memory, the practicer of all virtues, the conqueror of his six passions of powerful mind, surpassing all, and fully acquainted with the science of morality and political science, the father had ruled over these subjects for sixty years. And he then died, mourned by all his subjects. And, after him, O first of men, 
Thou hast acquired this hereditary kingdom of the Kurus for the last thousand years. Thou wast installed while a child, and art thus protecting every creature. Janamejaya said, There hath not been born in our race a king who hath not sought the good of his subjects or been loved by them. Behold especially the conduct of my grandsires ever engaged in great achievements. How did my father, blessed with many virtues, meet with his death? Describe everything to me as it happened. I am desirous of hearing it from you. Saudi continued, thus directed by the monarch, those counselors, ever solicitous of the good of the king, told him everything exactly as it had occurred. And the counselor said, O king, that father of thine, that protector of the whole earth, that foremost of all persons obedient to the scriptures, became addicted to the sports of the field, even as Pandu of mighty arms, that foremost of all bearers of the bow in battle. He made over to us all the affairs of state from the most trivial to the most important. One day, going into the forest, he pierced a deer with an arrow. And having pierced it he followed it quickly on foot into the deep woods, armed with sword and quiver. He could not, however, come upon the lost deer. Sixty years of age and decrepit, he was soon fatigued and became hungry. He then saw in the deep woods a high-souled rishi. The rishi was then observing the vow of silence. The king asked him about the deer, but, though asked, he made no reply. At last the king, already tired with exertion and hunger, suddenly became angry with that rishi sitting motionless like a piece of wood in observance of his vow of silence. Indeed, the king knew not that he was a muni observing the vow of silence. Swayed by anger, thy father insulted him. O excellent one of the Bharata race, the king. Thy father taking up from the ground with the end of his bow a dead snake placed it on the shoulders of that muni of pure soul. But the muni spake not a word good or bad and was without anger. He continued in the same posture, bearing the dead snake. Adi Parva section 50. Saudi continued, the minister said, that king of kings then, spent with hunger and exertion, and having placed the snake upon the shoulders of that muni, came back to his capital. The muni had a son, born of a cow, of the name of Shringan. He was widely known, possessed of great prowess and energy, and very wrathful. Going, every day, to his preceptor he was in the habit of worshipping him. Commanded by him, Shringan was returning home, when he heard from a friend of his about the insult of his father by thy parent. And, O tiger among kings, he heard that his father, without having committed any fault, was bearing, motionless like a statue, upon his shoulders a dead snake placed thereon. O king, the rishi insulted by thy father was severe in ascetic penances, the foremost of munis, the controller of passions, pure, and ever engaged in wonderful acts. His soul was enlightened with ascetic penances, and his organs and their functions were under complete control. His practices and his speech were both very nice. He was contented and without avarice. He was without meanness of any kind and without envy. He was old and used to observe the vow of silence. And he was the refuge whom all creatures might seek in distress. Such was the rishi insulted by thy father. The son, however, of that rishi, in wrath, cursed thy father. Though young in years, the powerful one was old in ascetic splendor. Speedily touching water, he spake, burning as it were with spiritual energy and rage, these words in allusion to thy father, behold the power of my asceticism. Directed by my words, the snake Tikshaka of powerful energy and virulent poison, shall, within seven nights hence, burn, with his poison the wretch that hath placed the dead snake upon my unoffending father. And having said this, he went to where his father was. And seeing his father he told him of his curse. The tiger among rishis thereupon sent to thy father a disciple of his, named Garmuka, of amiable manners and possessed of every virtue. And having rested a while, after arrival at court, he told the king everything, saying in the words of his master, Thou hast been cursed, O king, by my son. Tikshaka shall burn thee with his poison. Therefore, O king, be careful. O Janamejaya, hearing those terrible words, thy father took every precaution against the powerful snake Tikshaka. And when the seventh day had arrived, a Brahmana Rishi, named Kasyapa, desired to come to the monarch. But the snake Tikshaka saw Kasyapa. And the prince of snakes spake unto Kasyapa without loss of time, saying, Where dost thou go so quickly, and what is the business on which thou goest? Kasyapa replied, saying, O Brahmana, I am going whither King Parikshit, that best of the Kurus, is. 
He shall today be burnt by the poison of the snake Tikshaka. I go there quickly in order to cure him, in fact, in order that, protected by me, the snake may not bite him to death. Tikshaka answered, saying, Why dost thou seek to revive the king to be bitten by me? I am that Tikshaka. O Brahmana, behold the wonderful power of my poison. Thou art incapable of reviving that monarch when bit by me. So saying, Tikshaka, then and there, bit a lord of the forest, a banyan tree. And the banyan, as soon as it was bit by the snake, was converted into ashes. But Kasyapa, O king, revived it. Tikshaka thereupon tempted him, saying, Tell me thy desire. And Kasyapa, too, thus addressed, spake again unto Tikshaka, saying, I go there from desire of wealth. And Tikshaka, thus addressed, then spake unto the high-souled Kasyapa in these soft words, O sinless one, take from me more wealth than what thou expectest from that monarch, and go back. And Kasyapa, that foremost of men, thus addressed by the snake, and receiving from him as much wealth as he desired, wended his way back. And Kasyapa going back, Tikshaka, approaching in disguise, blasted, with the fire of his poison, thy virtuous father, the first of kings, then staying in his mansion with all precautions. And after that, thou wast, O tiger among men, been installed, on the throne. And, O best of monarchs, we have thus told thee all that we have seen and heard, cruel though the account is. And hearing all about the discomfiture of thy royal father, and of the insult to the Rishi Utanka, decide thou that which should follow. Saudi continued, King Janamejaya, that chastiser of enemies, then spake up to all his ministers. And he said, When did ye learn all that happened upon that? Banyan reduced to ashes by Tikshaka, and which, wonderful as it is, was afterwards revived by Kasyapa. Assuredly, my father could not have died, for the poison could have been neutralized by Kasyapa with his mantras. That worst of snakes, of sinful soul, thought within his mind that if Kasyapa resuscitated the king bit by him, he, Tikshaka, would be an object of ridicule in the world owing to the neutralization of his poison. Assuredly, having thought so, he pacified the Brahmana. I have devised a way, however, of inflicting punishment upon him. I like to know, however, what ye saw or heard, what happened in the deep solitude of the forest, viz. the words of Tikshaka and the speeches of Kasyapa. Having known it, I shall devise the means of exterminating the snake race. The minister said, Hear, O monarch of him who told us before of the meeting between that foremost Brahmana and that prince of snakes in the woods. A certain person, O monarch, had climbed up that tree containing some dry branches with the object of breaking them for sacrificial fuel. He was not perceived either by the snake or by the Brahmana. And, O king, that man was reduced to ashes along with the tree itself. And, O king of kings, he was revived with the tree by the power of the Brahmana. That man, a Brahmana's menial, having come to us, represented fully everything as it happened between Tikshaka and the Brahmana. Thus have we told thee, O king, all that we have seen and heard. And having heard it, O tiger among kings, ordain that which should follow. Saudi continued, King Janamejaya, having listened to the words of his ministers, was sorely afflicted with grief, and began to weep. And the monarch began to squeeze his hands. And the lotus-eyed king began to breathe a long and hot breath, shed tears, and shrieked aloud. And possessed with grief and sorrow, and shedding copious tears, and touching water according to the form, the monarch spake. And reflecting for a moment, as if settling something in his mind, the angry monarch, addressing all ministers, said these words. I have heard your account of my father's ascension to heaven. Know ye now what my fixed resolve is. I think no time must be lost in avenging this injury upon the wretch Tikshaka that killed my father. He burnt my father making Shringan only a secondary cause. From malignity alone he made Kasyapa return. If that Brahmana had arrived, my father assuredly would have lived. What would he have lost if the king had revived by the grace of Kasyapa and the precautionary measures of his ministers? From ignorance of the effects of my wrath, he prevented Kasyapa, that excellent of Brahmanas, whom he could not defeat, from coming to my father with the desire of reviving him. The act of aggression is great on the part of the wretch Tikshaka who gave wealth unto that Brahmana in order that he might not revive the king. I must now avenge myself on my father's enemy to please myself, the Rishi Utanka and you all.